Hi guys, today we're going to cover brain abnormalities in murderers, indicated by positron, positron emission tomogra tomography, and this study was done by Ray Natal in 1997 and is part of the OCR A2 psychology specification. Um, for those studying applied psychology um, and particularly criminal psych psychology. So basically a posit positron emission tomography is a um, sort of a scan that is done um, using radioactive uh, injection, um, some type of glucose, um, and it basically allows you to monitor the uh, metabolism in, in different parts of the body, and in this case, the brain. So in the bottom right of the screen, you can see an image um, of just a random one I got off Google, but an image of um, sort of what it looks like when you scan the brain using this method. And you can clearly see it allows you to monitor the activity where it's red is, um, I believe, the highest um, in different parts of the brain. So, yep, yeah, that is what we're going to be delving into today. OK, so there are a number of key words you need to remember for this study. Um, there's mainly these ones I've listed below. Um, an NGRI um, means a person who is not guilty for reasons of insanity. So in this study, there is a bunch of murderers who basically pleaded not guilty because they had reasons of insanity and we'll talk about that later on but from now on they're going to be referred to as NGRIs um, so just bear that one in mind and this study was essentially a quasi experiment and this um, if you don't already know is our experiments where the naturally occurring sorry where the independent variable is naturally occurring um, such as age and gender and in this study is basically whether they were a murderer or not um, or whether they, whether they pled guilty for reasons of insanity or not, um, or they were normal, essentially. Anyway, we're going to be delving into that later, but, yep, this was a quasi-experiment. Um, and basically, because this study measures um, parts of the brain, you're going to need to know the different parts of the brain. <laughs> um, and these are basically split into two categories, the cortex and the subcortex. Um, in the cortex, you have the prefrontal cortex, parietal cortex, temporal cortex, and occipital cortex. And in the subcortex, you have um, the corpus callosum, amygdala, the medial temporal, including the hippocampus, um, the thalamus, midbrain, and cere cerebellum. I don't know how you pronounce it. Anyway, you might remember these from previous studies. Um, I studied psychology a long time ago, and I vaguely remember the corpus callosum from the split, split brain study. So yeah, um, if you don't know what those parts of the brains are, uh, just sort of look it up. They're not, you don't have to know all of them, but there's a few key ones in this experiment, particularly the prefrontal cortex. You're going to need to know um, amygdala is quite important in this one um, and a few of the others, but those are the two main ones I'd recommend getting to know. So I've added a little diagram just so you can get a visual representation of whereabouts the different parts of the brains are located. And yeah, you can see the amygdala and prefrontal cortex, two of the ones that said you get you have to know in this one. Um, and you can see the different roles that they play. So the prefrontal cortex, um, this basically plays a role in the regulation of com complex cognitive, emotional and behavioral functioning, which is why it's so important in this in this particular instance. Um, and the amygdala um, is essentially the emotional center of the brain. And I guess the hippocampus is involved in forming, storing and processing uh, memories. So all of these um, are basically going to crop up again um, later on in this PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so just just so you know, just familiar, familiarize yourself with these different parts of the brain and whereabouts they're located. Theories behind this study. So in a pilot sample of 22 NGRI offenders compared to 22 normal offenders, Ray Natal 1994 believed that there was prefrontal dysfunction. So essentially, um, this is the same experimenter who uh, partook in this particular study where we're focusing on. And a few years before he did this one, he um, did a pilot sample and he found that in the front part of the brain, there showed some dysfunction. So he basically wanted to delve into this a little bit further. Um, so the aim of this um, study was to build on prior research and they divide two hypotheses. The first was um, that seriously violent individuals pleading NGRI have relatively localized brain dysfunction in the prefrontal cortex, the gyrus, amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, and corpus callosum. Um, all of these areas of the brain had previously been linked 
uh, empirically or conceptually to violence. And the second hypothesis was that seriously violent individuals pleading NGRI show no dysfunction in other areas of the brain. Um, so essentially what they wanted to try, what they theorized is that there's particularly parts of the brain that are linked to violence and there's other parts of the brain which aren't linked to violence. And so the parts of the brain that are linked to violence should show um, significant differences when compared to normal people. Um, and the other parts of the brain should show no significant differences. So essentially they just wanted to test these two hypotheses um, and we'll get onto that later. Research methods. This study was a quasi experiment and the, as we mentioned earlier, the IV, uh, whether the participant was a murderer um, who pled NGRI or was a normal non-murderer um, was naturally occurring. It's important to note that um, no one took any medication in this study apart from six uh, schizophrenics who were selected as matches for the six schizophrenic murderers. And the dependent variable um, was essentially whether the participant showed evidence of brain dysfunction in their prefrontal cortex and other areas of the brain which had previously been linked to violent behaviour. Matched participants design. So basically um, to control different variables, the extraneous variables, they matched um, the participants on age, gender and history of schizophrenia across the different uh, control groups. The sample consisted of 41 participants who were tried in California, 39 men and two women with a mean age of 34.3 years old. Um, they were charged with either murder or manslaughter and were sent to California. Ivine, don't know how you pronounce it, imaging center for these reasons. A, to obtain evidence as to whether they were NGRI. Um, B, could they understand the judicial, judicial process? and C, any evidence of diminished mental capacity which can affect the sentencing nature. There were six schizophrenics, 23 with head, injury, head injuries or brain damage, three with a history of psycho, psychoactive drug use, two had affective disorders, two had epilepsy, three um, had hyperactivity and learning disabilities, and there were two with personality disorders. Some quick additional sample information. Um, in seven of the cases, there was unusual circumstances in the crime that led to suspicion of mental impairment. The control group of 41 participants, 39 men and two women, were matched by age and gender. Um, the six people who were who had schizophrenia uh, were also matched with six schizophrenic non-offenders, which we just discussed. And the rest were screened and showed no signs of psychiatric illness in the uh, control group. So in this study, consent for forms were obviously completed and there were various materials used. Um, these included a thermoplastic head holder to hold the participants' heads while they were being scanned. Um, and these were individually molded for the different participants just to control any extraneous variables that that might create if they want. Um, the positron, positron emission tomography machine was used to image brain functioning. Um, and there was a radioactive substance that was injected into the participants um, to trace their brain metabolism. And this substance was called fluorodeoxyglucose. And from now on, we're just going to refer to that as FDG. Um, all of the participants had to perform a task. Um, and this essentially was where they had to detect target signals for 32 minutes. Uh, the task was known to make the frontal lobes work hard, um, combined with the right temporal and parietal lobes. So essentially this task that they had to conduct um, allowed the experimenters to see activity um, more easily um, when they were looking at the brain. So in this study, all of the participants were kept medication free for two weeks before the scans. 10 minutes before the FTG injection, all of the participants practiced the cognitive performance task. 30 seconds before receiving the FDG injections, the participants started the actual CPT so that the novelty of the task wouldn't be FDG labelled. It also got their brains uh, stimulated before they actually had to do the main task. And 32 minutes after the FTG injection, the participants were then transferred to a PT scanner room where 10 slices of their brains, <laughs> sorry, 10 pictures, which were referred to as slices, were taken off their brains at 10 millimeter intervals parallel to the canopheometal line 
Um, these scans showed details in relation to the difference, differences in brain metabolism in the six main cortical areas and the eight subcortical areas that were listed previously on slide uh, two or three. So here are the key findings. Um, I'm not going to go over all of them, but I but you can have a look for yourself and I'm just going to discuss the two main ones that I believe are the most important for you to remember. Um, so in the cortex, and particularly the prefrontal cortex, um, the murderers had lower activity in this region than the control group. And the experimenters interpreted this as, as, as basically being linked to loss of self-control and altered emotion. So because they have lower activity in that area, they were, weren't able to inhibit their um, behaviours their violent, violent behaviours. And I'm also going to talk about the amygdala, which had lower activity in the left uh, than the right side of the brain, in murderers than the, than the controls, and again this was very significantly uh, different. <laughs> um, and the experimenters interpreted to this as being because uh, these structures uh, form part of the limbic system, and problems with these structures may cause lack of inhibition for violent behaviour, uh, fearless, fearlessness and a failure to learn the negative effects of violence. So yeah, and um, you can see the table below and that shows the overall findings. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go over the key findings, uh, part two. 23 of the murderers had a history of head injury but, but showed no significant difference in functioning of their corpus callosum. And the experimenters accepted that this may have contributed to the reduction in the murderer's brain activity. So because of the head injuries, um, this may have actually caused some reduction in activity, in, obviously, in parts of the brain, and particularly in this case, the corpus callosum. There were also no significant differences um, between the performance on these cognitive performance tasks or handedness. Um, but with those who were left-handed murderers, um, they basically showed significantly less abnormal amygdala asymmetry than right-handed murderers. Don't worry about remembering this too much, but if you can, that's great. Uh, these key findings you definitely need to memorize. Um, so in summary, the murderers had reduced activity in some areas of the brain. Um, which had previously been linked to violent behaviour, and this included the prefrontal cortex, which is the main one, the left angular gyrus, and the corpus callosum. There were abnormal asymmetries in some parts of the brain um, in the murderers, um, which essentially reduced activity on the left and greater activity on the right side of some parts of the brain, um, and this, was, this entailed the amygdala, thalamus, and hippocampus, all parts of the limbic system. There were no differences in some areas of the brain, notably the areas associated, associated with mental illness, but not violent behaviour. So essentially, in um, the parts of the brain that had previously been not linked to violent behaviour, there were no differences, which we expected to see. So following on from the findings, the key conclusions, conclusions that the experimenters drew were that the murderers who pled NGRI had significant differences in the metabolism of glucose in numerous areas of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. There were numerous uh, specific physiological processes that may predispose some criminals to violent behaviour, such as reduced activity in the prefrontal cortex and abnormal symmetries in the amygdala. There are neural processes uh, that may be at play in violent behaviours, but they can't always be deducted to a single brain process. So it's hard to actually tell which which neural process is responsible for violent behaviour or whether they are even responsible at all. And this leads on to the next point, which is that the results do not show that violent behaviour is determined by biology alone. For example, you know, could there be social uh, factors at play here? And this leads it links into the nature versus nurture debate. Um, you know, if someone has a particularly bad childhood, which is filled with violence, does that mean that they're in the future going to become a murderer? Does it also alter their brain? Because we've seen in uh, different studies that brain, brains are plastic and they, um, you know, are moulded over time. So could your social environment actually affect this? Um, and obviously it's hard to actually determine cause and effect. Cause and effect. Um, could it be that violence actually causes brain dysfunction? Or 
is it always that brain dysfunction causes violence? Again, these are things that just can't be determined. And uh, yeah, as we say, violence cannot be explained by the results alone. Thank you for lis listening to this quick uh, quick summary of the Rain et al. 1987 experiment. And hopefully I'll see you again soon.